Warning, this episode contains adult language and adult humor. Since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults? If you are easily offended by these types of conversations, consider switching to the oboe. Welcome to the Trumpet Gurus Hang podcast. I'm your host, Jose Johnson. My guest for this episode is Rob Qualick. Rob is an extremely talented young lead trumpet player who gained popularity during his stint with the No BS Brass Band and for his impressive display of high chops in his viral videos. Rob is the author of the book, Taming the Stratosphere, a new transplant to the Nashville music scene and a connoisseur of fine craft brews. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. All right, and welcome to this week's episode of the Trumpet Guru's Hang, and I am here with the one, the only, the madman himself, Mr. Rob Qualick, RQ. What's going on, buddy? What's going on, y'all? Nothing much, nothing much. Just hanging out outside. It's, it's, it's so nice in Nashville right now. It's like 60 degrees. It's beautiful outside. Man, it was snowing up here last night in Pennsylvania. That's great. Yeah, it's supposed to get down into the 30s tonight, and it was, I think, 35 degrees here last night. Nashville temperature is just like, I mean, it'll get up to 75 and down to 30 in a day. It's wild. Yeah, it's cuckoo. So, uh, but yeah, you just recently moved down here, didn't you? Yeah, I moved down here. <laughs> right after I moved here, there was a huge tornado like a week after I moved here. And then a month after I moved here, this all, this corona stuff all broke out, and it's just <laughs> one hit after another. <laughs> it's, it's all your fault, dude. Yeah, it must be. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in true hang style, especially if I'm with my man Rob, I have to have a little frosty brew here. I'm going to join you. I got a little Three Floyd zombie dust, one of my uh, fa favorite brews. Yeah, it's one of mine too. I'm I'm doing a little bit of our one of our local breweries here, Trogues, the Lolly Hop. Uh, it's a uh, dry hopped with, uh, at, with uh, Mosaic, Citra, and Azaka. So it's a uh, nice, nice brew here. So I'm enjoying this with my boy. Uh, it, it, it's actually, the, it's funny uh, because uh, you and I haven't seen each other, like been in the same space, like, like so many of us. Uh, we haven't been in the same place for, uh, for a while, for a long time. But uh, we have stayed in touch. You know, we have stayed in touch uh, with our uh, almost daily sometimes <laughs> back and forth you and me and, and chris cromer on our our beer exploits so uh almost every night yeah <laughs> almost every night you're right about that <laughs> yeah so so what's been going on with you man i know uh you know you went through some some changes because uh you know when i first met you a few years ago you were living in richmond uh and you were you were doing the the uh, no BS brass thing, and then you've kind of uh, left that area and moved on to some other stuff. So, so what's what's the deal, man? What's what's shaking? Well, you know, life happens. Um, just you know, going going through some some stuff, and ended up uh, moving out here to Nashville. Um, a lot of opportunity out here. Um, just kind of the stars aligned for me to move out here, which everything was telling me to move out here. So I just kind of jumped in with two feet and, and here I am. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's cool. You know, the, it's, it's funny because for years, well, I mean, still you think about Nashville, you think about country music, but there's so much more going on down there than people, you know, give it credit for. So, um, absolutely. The recording scene down here is, is, is crazy. It is so crazy down here. There's so much stuff being recorded down here. So many people doing big things down here. Yeah. Have you been able to uh, connect with any of the people in the, the industry down there? I'm still connect, trying to get connected with people, but it's like I said, this happened like a month after I moved here. I just started playing gigs and kind of getting numbers and meeting people and then just bam, everything shuts down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but I'm working on some, some uh, online uh, stuff, doing videos with people, a couple in the works right now. Got one with uh, Reggie Chapman, uh, he was. He lives out in New York City. We're, we're yeah. doing a big band track that I'm playing on, and then Tyler and I are doing a couple of things and trying to stay trying to stay busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Re Reggie was in No BS with you, right? Yeah, bass bone player. Yeah, yeah, monster player, monster. 
Yeah, yeah. So I know, uh, like between between No BS and Nashville, you did some time. Uh, you were cruising, weren't you? Yeah, right when my well, what getting a divorce, so unfortunate, but um, decided to kind of clear my head and go do a cruise contract and kind of let everything realign, if that makes sense. And uh, yeah, yeah, and did that, and then I got off the cruise ship, and this coronavirus stuff started popping up in the news and I had another contract lined up because I was going to try to save up to move out here and uh, something in my stomach told me not to take that second one and come to find out that there was a coronavirus outbreak on the next ship I was going to be contracted on. Damn. And it was right after I was meant to join like three days after. Damn. So I'd probably still be on there stuck. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to be stuck anywhere, man, it's better to be stuck in the, your, your Jaeger's house right now, right? Yeah, hanging out with yeah. Tyler. We're going to do a little recording today, do a little hanging out. Yeah, it's better to be stuck uh, stuck there than it is to be uh, stuck on a ship somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. So, was that your first uh, ship contract, or have you done those before? Uh, I did one in uh, 2009. I did a short one. And uh, it's okay. It's It's not horrible, but... The musicianship is is lacking on there, and it is, uh, that's a nice way to put it. Okay, <laughs> but you are playing every day. I mean, you're getting a check, but you do go a little stir crazy on there. It's a <laughs> it's it's a bit of a life change doing that. And, and I understood from you uh, from some of your messages that they had a pretty shitty beer. Oh yeah, the best beer they had on there was it was Heineken, and and that was oh. like rare to get that. That was like the the top level like we had it sometimes uh i tell you man uh i was in europe last uh, right around thanksgiving um uh, my wife and i went to visit her family uh in romania and so we were we were over there and then we also stopped in dublin and oh yeah i was surprised at how shitty the beer was yeah <laughs> i was in Ireland last year and the, they had a, a couple of decent things i mean the guinness over there is great i did a guinness tour over there and you go up to the top of the Guinness factory yeah. and looking over the whole city and they give you a free pint and it was awesome. Did that. Did you get your certificate for learning how to pour the perfect pint? No, I should have done that. I didn't hey, do man, that. I got it. I'm legit. So <laughs> you can open up your bar now. <laughs> exactly. I've got that going for me. So, but yeah, I mean, it's like, I, I, they would have things like, Oh, American style IPA. And it's like, no, <laughs> Yeah, it's like the only place that I've been over in Europe where I've had really good beer is probably Belgium. I mean, and that's like completely different than over here. It's all the, the quads and triples and yeah, the wheat beers and stuff, which is great. But I think the U.S. has the best beer by far. And we got it going on, I'm telling you. I mean, yeah. Well, that's one of the bummer about Nashville is there's not a lot of great craft breweries around here. They got like Bearded Iris, which is good. And that's pretty much it that I'm aware of. There might be some stuff that I don't know about, but I haven't really found a lot of great beer here. But we do get three Floyds in the stores, which is awesome because I used to I used to go crazy for this back in Richmond. You'd have to like pay top dollar for that beer. Yeah, exactly. I uh, have a friend who uh, that I play with trombone player, and uh, his best friend lives out in Chicago, and he would come and visit for like. You know, two months in the summer, and he would always come stock with some zombie dust and some other three Floyd stuff. And it's like, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I had some uh, laser snake last night from Three Floyds. That's a really good one too. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you got to do what you got to do, man. So anyway, uh, I know that you've been, uh, yeah, you know, because you're like we're on the cruise ship. You know, you got to, you, you have to be a little versatile i guess because you're you know like with most most kind of shows like that you, know, you never know what you're going to be playing it's it's all over the board stylistically so uh but you know you kind of have made your name as like the big lead player so uh <laughs> were, you, were you having to uh to adjust your your playing style to, to match what was going on in the ship or uh not too much because back in richmond i was doing like musicals i was doing uh some church gigs, classical stuff, doing session work and then doing lead work. It was kind of uh, funny because the it was a lead and solo chair. They've kind of cut out two trumpets down to one trumpet on most of the ships. So I had to do jazz combo work and then uh, show work and then um, 
guest entertainer work and there wasn't a lot of like really high hitting like stuff that I was used to playing. So I really had to like kind of punch myself back into shape on the extreme up register when I got back home. Cause I think the highest note I ever had to play was a G on the, on the cruise ship. Uh, and for you, that's like, uh, that's like your uh, pedal tones, isn't it Rob? <laughs> no, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember, uh, it was an ITG in Columbus uh, when you and uh, and Jaeger and Augie were uh, were off doing your uh, "You're Still a Young Man" video. <laughs> that video, there's two of them floating around. One's at almost a million views, and it's like, man, why did that video get that many views? Nothing musical about that video at all. <laughs> uh, that nice fat double D, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, meathead video so meathead oh <laughs> uh, yeah well you know you got to go through that phase you know yeah but uh yeah so I, I know you've been uh doing some some online teaching and stuff like that i mean how how's that transitioning for you is that just something that, that you you want to see yourself doing a lot more of or yeah you know, i'm doing to... some i'm doing some skype lessons and and uh and facetime lessons and stuff uh i did it a little bit before all this broke out um, it's tough though, cause you can't really hear somebody's sound doing it. You can't like, sometimes if people don't have a really good mic, you're playing and it just sounds really flat or really sharp. And you're like, man, that sounds crazy coming through my speakers right now. And then there's that delay too. Yeah. And if you're playing something, you're like, hold on, hold on, hold on. And it doesn't go two ways. And it's just like, it, it works, it works, but it's, it's tough. Yeah, well, you know, if, if if it's me playing for you, it's going to sound like ass whether I was there or whether I was doing it virtually. So <laughs> it might actually sound better. For the phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, yeah, you know that's that's the thing, man. Like the technology, um, you know, ten years ago, this would have been completely unheard of, but now everybody's got to pivot. And you know, I know even a lot of the cats like out in L, uh, a lot of the LA guys, uh, you know, New York guys are doing their sessions virtually because. You, know, you can't get into the studio to work. So, um, you know, making making the pivot. So um, I mean, it helps to be able to embrace technology. And I, I think that's where a lot of the, the older cats are having trouble because, you know, they, they're they not as, as up on things. But, um, you know. Right. Yeah. It's, it's cool seeing all these like um, acapella videos where people are putting together tunes and stuff and then people are getting together and doing online sessions and stuff doing like online concerts, which is pretty cool. And I always try to check them out when I can, Yeah. but it's tough right now. Everybody's like kind of trying to sell tickets and stuff for the online stuff and take donations and stuff. But it's tough because everybody's in the same boat trying to hustle out to get some money playing online. So everybody's kind of doing the same thing. Yeah. You know, you're trying to do the same thing and you're in, in some cases you're, um, you know, you're all dipping into the same drying well, you know, because you know, you know, guys aren't working, you know, it's hard for them to come up with a scratch to, you know, or at least justify coming up with a scratch to pay for uh, the, you know, give you a, a decent tip, you know, when, when they don't know where their next paycheck's coming from. So exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, when uh, I think the last time that we were together, when was the last time we were together? Was that uh, ITG or was it? It was ITG in, was it Hershey or was it Columbus? It was Hershey. Yes, Hershey. That's 2017 yeah. maybe? Six, yeah. 16 or 17? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. I mean, man, time just goes by so fast. And, and that's one of the things I miss the most. And that's, you know, the whole reason for the podcast is is uh, trying to keep the hang going because, you know, it, that's that's so much fun you know that that was to me always like 99 percent of going to one of those conferences was just you know going to the bar and hanging no so, that was a percent of it for me yeah. <laughs> seeing everybody you haven't seen in years and, and hanging out and telling the stories and man i itg and ntc are so much fun oh i think the next one's in california that's pretty far from here yeah, Anaheim, I think, is uh, 2021. Yeah, that, yeah, this year that, was in Ohio, and I was like, oh, it's only five hours or six hours away. That's going to be great. Nope. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I was just saying, you know, actually, NTC was this year supposed to be at Messiah, which I think is the first time I actually met you is at NTC at Messiah in Pennsylvania, yeah, in, in, right outside of Harrisburg. 
And um, so it's supposed to be back at Messiah this year, which obviously got canceled. And then uh, ITG was supposed to be in Columbus, which is you know where I'm originally from. I was born there, and my sister still lives there. So I was like, "Damn, man, this is gonna be great this year." You know, I can I can go to the thing in Messiah. You know, stay at home. I can go to one in Columbus. I can stay at my sister's place. Psst, man, <laughs> there goes that. Such a bummer. It's such a bummer. Yeah. So, I mean, what else has been going on with you, man? I mean, uh, you know, I know you, you, you said you had you know, some life changes, some career changes, location changes. What else is up? Uh, you know, just uh, trying to keep up with the times. The technology is frustrating sometimes and just trying to it, it's tough just trying to like keep in communication with everybody, because when this is over, I don't think things are just going to snap back. I think it's going to be quite some time before we're out playing normally again. I think it's going to be. I think we're going to lose a lot of good musicians because of this. I think that people are going to going to move on to other things because I think this is going to put a lot of doubt in people's minds that it's doable as a career anymore, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely makes sense. Um, I'm actually uh, working with some people uh, outside of the music you know, genre uh, with some small business owners. And we kind of have a little think tank consortium going on and, and talking about the necessity to innovate and to pivot and, you know, do things like that, especially it's like in general, most people, they, they get something going uh, and they just want to stick with it. And then you don't want to change until basically until shit happens. And then you start trying to you know, you start rushing around trying to figure out what to do instead of being proactive in it. And I think that, um, you know, it just the music industry, like so many other industries, uh, we've got complacent with the way things were. And it's like, you know, this is the way it always has been. So it's the way it always will be. And now people are forced to kind of th rethink what they're doing and why they're doing it and how they're doing it. And right. it, I think it, 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 there's a potential, like at any point in history, anytime shit's gone sideways, that's an opportunity for growth and innovation because it's at that point where it's like no this old stuff ain't going to work anymore we got to come up with a new and a better way so you know i i, I don't know what's going to look like uh we were talking earlier uh, off off camera about the denmark uh drive-in concerts you know and that's kind of a an interesting concept so yeah um, i like that that looks pretty awesome kind of like a drive-in movie theater but you got the concerts but i feel like that would be good for a temporary thing. I don't know how you could, it'd be tough. You'd have to charge a lot of money for tickets and you're still risking the musicians up on stage. Um, Cause everybody's in such close quarters and you, and you still got people setting stuff up. And I feel like if it was done safely, it would be a great, great, awesome thing. Yeah. Or it wouldn't get sick. Well, you know, and, and even things like, um, Hey, yeah, I know a lot of people are doing this. You're doing like doing their living room concerts, you know, doing the you know, the, the live streams and stuff like that. And uh, Trent Austin, uh, Trent did a backyard concert. Just you know, got a got a few people, his wife and a few people, and, and they maintain safe social distancing, uh, playing on their on his uh, back patio, and you know, just playing for the neighbors, basically, I guess. But I think there's a lot of opportunities out there that could. I mean, it could lead to some really interesting stuff. I know? agree. Yeah, yeah, we just got and one. I think one of the tough things right now is everybody's really stressed out about money and where the future is going to go. And people are picking up jobs and doing like Instacart and, and Uber Eats and stuff and just trying to keep their head above water. I feel like there's not a, a there's a decrease in creativity right now because everybody's so stressed out. And the guys like Trent Austin and and like that and they're doing awesome things and kind of keeping everybody's hopes up like, Oh, maybe we can do this. And so those I think are like the innovators right now doing the online stuff like that and kind of keeping everybody's hope alive. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I remember seeing something uh, just a couple of weeks ago about uh, Josh, Josh Landris, like, uh, you know, playing taps every night. Yeah. You know, just, so it, it, I think ultimately, for so many people that are pros and, you know, this, this goes again across the board. If you, there's something that, that you love doing and then you start doing it as a profession, sometimes you get trapped by the money, you know, 
It's like, yeah, it, it, it stops being something that you do because you love doing it. It's something that you do because you're getting paid to do it. And, uh, you know, you see it in athletes, you see it in, you know, in, in other professions as well. So I think for a lot of players, you know, this, this, but yeah, it sucks. I mean, honestly, I mean, I'm in the same boat, uh, you know, because pretty much everything I do is gig based, whether it's music or my coaching and consulting or speaking and stuff like that, you know, it's, it's gig based. So I don't have any income coming in. Um, however, uh, I love what I'm doing. And so I would want to do this whether I got paid or not. So this is kind of that gut check. So I think for a lot of players, that's going to be the same thing. It's like, you know, hey, am I am I really playing trumpet because I love making music or am I doing this because, you know, I'm able to drive that Lambo like you got. You know? <laughs> right, right. So funny trumpet players driving the Lambo, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're driving it. They're driving it from the valet parking spot. <laughs> They got the '86 Corsica. <laughs> oh, you step it up in the world if you got the '86 Corsica. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's too funny. No, I mean, what, what do you, what do you think is going on? What, what do you see the future of of uh, trumpet playing as being? I really don't know. Um, yeah, because yeah, I really don't know live wise, but I think that. I think that this could be good for the recording industry because everybody always wants to cut the arts, cut the arts, and, oh, we don't need that. Let's cut their funding. But everybody's at home right now watching movies, listening to music, playing video games. It all has music on it. If you took the music off of that stuff, think about watching a movie with no music on it. That would be crazy, right? Yeah. Or video games with no music and stuff like that. So I feel like with this, um, people are going to start creating more online content videos shows games and stuff like that and it's going to have it's going to have a greater need a, more of a demand for people to be composing and and um and recording music for this kind of stuff so i feel like in that sense it could kind of kind of shift from live to recorded stuff for a lot of guys yeah yeah i know you were doing a lot of stuff uh before you went out on the cruise ship i remember you like you were like every seem like every day you're putting up something you know you playing some crazy stuff uh you're working on your your chase stuff and your uh you know your jerry hay charts and stuff um what kind of gear are you using these days for recording um so horn wise i got uh a warburton 234 trumpet medium large bore and then uh colicchio 1s2 and then a burbank bench 3x or the three that i kind of go between and just some custom uh, Warburton mouthpieces and stuff that Terry Terry's made for me over the years. Yeah, yeah. I, so in in terms of, like in terms of your your uh, your recording setup, I mean, you know, using like Logic or Cubase oh, or yeah, Pro I'm Tools. Using, uh, using Studio One right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have the greatest um, setup, but it gets the job done. It gets yeah. enough where somebody can EQ it, and mix it, and it sounds okay. But yeah, I'm just using a um, Studio One and a PreSonus audio interface, and I think a, a Shure microphone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the stuff that you were doing sounded sounded great. And are you are you doing any tracks for anybody right now? Or um, right now, no, I'm not working on anything at the moment. Um, doing doing a couple got a couple videos in the works, like the acapella kind of. Um, kind of videos where it's like six eight ten people playing and it's got them all on the screen at the same time kind of playing yeah and yeah. uh tyler yeager and i are actually gonna we're working on something today to probably put out fairly soon um doing like kind of a, a maynard ferguson kind of kind of uh trumpet ensemble kind of thing it's pretty it's pretty cool uh right, did you uh, did you arrange it or did uh or did uh, uh yeager do it Actually, it's an. I can't remember if you played on it or not. It's the arrangement that we did at ITG at their booth. Oh yeah, with so uh, that wrote. Uh, yeah, Chapman did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was there for that. Yeah, that was fun. Another uh, ITG fun time. Oh man, <laughs> that, that was that was something. That lineup. I mean, it's like uh, you, Jaeger, uh, Ryan, Chapman. JP. 
Yeah, JB directed <laughs> uh, uh, Mike Vax. Yep. Uh, yeah. uh, oh, Kim, Jerry. Yeah. And, uh, um, Steve Justice, maybe? No, I Steve think... wasn't there. Okay. Uh, was... um... And then Little Dude. Oh, yeah. Uh, can't remember Max. His name. Max, yeah. Max. Max. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, but boy, Max, he's probably like Big Dude now. But... Yeah, I wonder how he's doing, man. He ate the trumpet up. He loved it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, I, yeah, dude, just, you know, can you put the trumpet down for like five minutes, please? <laughs> Yeah, man. Yeah, I hope he's doing well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually just talked to Chapman the other day, and uh, yeah, he's he's still a character. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, talking about a guy with some crazy chops. Yeah, that guy has insane chops. Yeah, I remember I was hanging out with him and Steve Reed one time at the Warburton factory, and we recorded some meathead stuff. And we stacked a chord, and I played the lowest note, which was double C. <laughs> that was the lowest note. That is scary. And then Chapman played a G above double C, and then Steve Reed played a B flat above double C, which was like, oh, God. <laughs> it was insane. Th that is I nuts. Need to, I need to find that video now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, I, yeah, speaking of uh, insane high notes and stuff like that, I know that you've uh, you did a, a book, the uh, Taming the Stratosphere book uh, years ago. And um, I understand you're working on a second edition. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm working on a volume two of that book uh, during the quarantine. Um, it's 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 going to be similar. It's not going to like go up to like stupid high triple Q sharps and stuff, but it's more of like a book to kind of learn how to play lines in the upright service because lead players are a dime a dozen. You can just peck it. You can just play a double G at the end of a song, but there's not many guys who are playing lines up and down from double C musically. Yeah. And I'm trying to like write the book geared towards you're playing music up there and playing that high instead of just like pounding out some really sharp high notes. If that makes sense. Like a lot of guys. Yeah. 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 I, well, I hear you. Um, I was, who was I talking to about this? Um, it might have been Wayne. Yeah, I think it was Wayne. Uh, we were talking about Maynard and his approach, you know, to playing. And um, I just remember uh, when I was, I think it was in high school or something, and he had been talking at a, at a, a workshop about the best way to improve your, your upper register, which, of course, if you're in any, if you, ever had a chance to ask Maynard a question that was usually the one that people would ask like how do you play so high and uh he said the the best way to practice was to take a ballad and to play it and then take it up a minor third and just keep taking taking it up a minor third to increase your yeah you're going to increase your range but you're doing it in a musical in a lyrical way uh so yeah I think yeah you're absolutely spot on man it's like you know a lot of the approaches uh, it's about how to get up there, you know, but <laughs> once you're up there, it's like you're hanging on, hanging on to a, a pole or something going, shit, how do I get down? It's like walking on a tightrope. It's like just a little bit too much on one side and you fall off. So it's kind of like everybody says ride the airstream. And th there's a lot of general terms out there that I'm just like, ah, that, like play more musically or, or more air. It's like, ah, that's kind of right but like mostly wrong i think it's just you got to find it's like doing gymnastics you can't just say go do a backflip you got to like you got to have you got to learn how to do have your feet right first and then you got to learn okay you can't just do it you got to you got to do a half of one first and then you get three quarters of the way through and you fall on your face a bunch of times which is kind of how i learned how to do it and these exercises are things that i kind of like like tonguing in the upper register like if you can tongue a double G, you could double tongue a double G, you've got a double G under your belt. You know what I mean? Instead of just squeaking one out at the end of a song, if that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I can't even double tongue a G in the staff, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that, that, that ruins that idea. Uh, so, uh, you, you played in the, or you, you marched with the Scouts, didn't you? Yeah, Madison Scouts in 2005. Uh, did uh, you feel that that was a a good base for your playing, nice and loud? And yeah, yeah, that definitely. <laughs> I 
was playing on some ridiculous equipment back then. I played on a 6A, 4A in, in Madison Scouts. That's a bent dime with a hole in it. With not much of a hole in it either. No, and I, I couldn't play on that if you gave me $10,000 right now. Way too small. But it worked back then. So you, you found that your uh, your approach has, has changed over the years? Definitely. And I've uh, a couple of times gone through major weight changes. Like uh, I've gone from over 300 to about 200. So I've gone up and down about 100 pounds. Damn. And, um, yeah, when it happens, I had to relearn how to play the trumpet twice, basically. Like I couldn't play high C because when you're losing weight, and I did it quickly for auditions for the military, for the, the Navy Commodores. And um, when you're losing weight like that, you lose some muscle mass. Right. And you're, 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 the shape of your face changes, and it's, it's really tough to kind of balance that out because like, it's just your body's changing so fast. It's hard to keep up with it. And then when you get down to where you got to get to, it's really tough, and you got to like kind of hit the trumpet with a different approach, if, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's the one thing I can you know, talking to so many, especially, I mean, I'm, I'm no spring chicken, but, um, you know, when you talk to, to guys that have been around and been in the business for a while, especially those that are like in their, you know, late sixties, seventies, you know, even the guys that, that are, you know, even pushing the eighties and stuff like that. Um, and if they're still playing and playing at a high level, they've had to go through some adjustments. You know, it's like you can't you can't approach the horn the same way at at 70 that you could when you were 20. You it's can't just, do it the same as you were 20 as when you're 30. Yeah, it's totally different. It's like you, you can't be that bull anymore. You kind of got to like, OK, I got to I got to back off on this a little bit. I'm going to hurt myself kind of thing. When I was 18, 19, I was just. I could play a six hour gig triple forte the whole time and feel fine afterwards. And now it's like, Oh man, if I play one set too hard, I'm like, Oh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Well, I mean, phys it's from a physiological perspective, you know, your, your body, as you get older, you start to lose things like collagen and you know, that's the elasticity in your, in your skin and your tissue. So that's so critical for trumpet players. You know, if, if when you're young, yeah, your, 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 your body bounces back, you know, it's the same thing like when I teach a martial arts, you know, there's there's stuff people would ask me like, well, why don't you do this anymore? I'm like, I mean, I could still do it, but, you know, I wouldn't be able to do anything else for the next six days you know, before I recover from it. But, uh, you know, it's like you got to be you got to be smart, man. Right. Yeah. And that's like if I get a choice to play lead or not, I choose no. Like whenever I get called for the temptations or the four tops things, I'm always the first one there. And I'm always the first one in the third chair. I get there first. And if anybody has anything to say, hey, I got here first and I chose third. Yeah. And I'm happy with that. I don't want to play lead on that. <laughs> it's fun. I've done it many times, but I'd much rather play third. So did you, uh, were you, were you the guy that wanted to play lead when you were younger? Absolutely. And like with no BS, I wrote that book as hard as I could when I was 21 22 whenever i joined i wrote it as as hard as i could and it's still as hard as something i can play it's still like oh my god every time i play it it's like oh why did i do this in my back <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just crazy well, you know it's, it's ego stuff man you know when you're when you're young you know feeling it you know you just you just want to show off and and uh, then you get a little older. It's like, nah, man, fuck that. <laughs> I'm, <just kidding. laughs> I'm getting paid the same as everybody else. Why am I playing two octaves higher? Yeah. Yep. Unless you get lead trumpet play, you know, if you're getting paid extra for the lead book, you know, but, you know. That's pretty rare. Yeah. But uh, you're not getting paid by the note. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, you get. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, the. Like with lead playing, I mean, I've, I've talked to so many people about it, you know, people on the podcast, people you know, just hanging. It's like so many people think about lead playing as just being able to play high, but there's so much more to it. I mean, what, when, when somebody asks you, you know, what's your concept of what it takes to be a good lead player? I mean, what, what do you tell them? You got to you got to be a leader. You got to know the style like you got. You can't just go in there and wing it. If you're playing a bassy tune, you got to have extensive knowledge of bassy. You got to know how hard you can lean it back 
Or if you're playing like a salsa gig, you got to know to stay on top of it. You can't lean it back because because the horns are kind of following the lead trumpet in most situations. And like, um, you, yeah, you just kind of got to be a leader, and you can't you can't go in there and just kind of wing it. You gotta you gotta do your homework before, if that makes sense. You gotta you gotta really know what you want to do with the music before you even play it. Like you. You got to know, okay, I'm going to scoop up to this. We're going to, this needs to be cut off on four. You kind of got to be the, the leader on that kind of stuff. So yeah. it's real tight. So what was the craziest lead gig you ever had to play? Oh. Besides no BS. I got to oh. think about this. Um, uh, I played in this band in, uh, in college called the Upper East Side Big Band run by uh, Samson Trin in, um, in Richmond, Virginia. I'm not sure if the band is around anymore, but whew, he wrote these Las Vegas tunes. He did it. We actually recorded an album um, called the Abbey Road Project, and it was uh, the whole Abbey Road album for big band. It was awesome. And yeah. it was stupidly, stupidly hard, like double tonguing on, on high Gs and then like Bs. I think there was an E above double C somewhere on it. It was he just wrote that that Las Vegas kind of in your face like oh my god when you heard it kind of stuff, but it was awesome and I loved every second of it. But it was like I felt like somebody threw me down the stairs after those gigs. Uh, I can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, yeah, that I would love to hear that. So if you if you find it, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll find it. I think it's. I'm not sure if it's on Apple, but I'll 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 check it out and I'll send it to you if I if I find it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. That that sounds uh, just sounds completely ridiculous. So <laughs> it was really hard. I was I was young in that recording too. I was maybe 23, 24, 23, 22, somewhere around there. But that was one of the toughest things I've had to do. Uh, are you originally from Richmond? Uh, no, uh, Illinois, normal Illinois. <laughs> Illinois State University. That's the only thing it's known for. That and State Farm Insurance. Oh man. And nothing normal about you, bro. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing. So, I mean, you, you you said earlier about losing weight and, you know, having to change your playing, you know, do you, do you feel like, do you feel more secure when you're playing in, in a, you know, like a, a, a boxer or a fighter or an athlete, you know, everybody's got like their prime weight, you know, where they feel best. Where, where do you feel best? Heavy. When I was, I'm strongest at when I was bigger because you got more to push with than the upper register and like a lot of great well I kid no I'm not even going to say that I was going to say there's a lot of good big lead players but there's a lot of good small lead players though too I mean Gary Grant yeah yeah Wayne, all those guys and then you got the everybody else it's just yeah I guess it's just where you feel best at but I'd say it's not a huge difference I mean once I kind of lost the weight and kind of learned where everything was again I'd say it's probably a 10% not as powerful when I'm lower, mm -hmm. but it's not a crazy, crazy amount. It's just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, we're going to get into some other kind of crazy questions later on, but I mean, this is going to be kind of a, a stat, a, a very stock trumpet player question. Um, I, who, who are the guys that just like really impacted you in terms of, of uh, you developing your, your love for trumpet and, you know, especially you know, being a lead player. Man, definitely Maynard. I had all these LPs growing up and I used to do, this is crazy, but I, so like, uh, if I'd work on MacArthur park, so I couldn't play an A in high school, had a G and sometimes a G sharp. So I'd take the record and I'd put my finger on it real light. So it would slow it down and bend it, <laughs> and, it and I would play it down a half step or a whole step. And it was tough because it's, you can't get it just right. And it's, right. it's kind of speeding up and slowing down. But you could kind of, kind of get there and, and hold the high note. You're like, oh yeah, I got it, I got it, kind of thing. And uh, another guy who was a huge influence to me was Chuck Mangione. I used to love yeah. his stuff in high school. Used to love it. Feels so good. Yeah, Children of Sanchez. Yeah. Oh yeah. Used to love listening to Chuck. <laughs> yeah. I you know I was driving around the car the other day and uh, yeah I have satellite right radio on my car and. Uh, they pulled a uh, like a lost hit from the eighties, and it was a uh, "Give It All You Got." Oh yeah, I was Great. like, yeah, 
Man, that band was killing. Oh, yes. Chris Vidala and uh, Grant Geisman. Yeah. Yeah, was... people usually give me a bunch of crap about listening to music like that, too, man. Like, I like disco music and all that kind of stuff, and everybody's like, oh, you're crazy, man. I'm like, go go back and listen to some of that stuff. Oh, go listen at... to the horn sections. Those are the most insane horn sections ever. I was uh, listening the other day. Uh, there's a guy that I, I started to uh, to follow on Facebook and Instagram and stuff, uh, Christian James Han. And uh, he does these things where he takes a recording and he breaks it down and does kind of like a track by track. And one of the ones that he did, I was listening to the other day, and I was like, well, I really don't want to listen to it, but it just came up on the playlist. It was YMCA. Oh, man. <laughs> And listening to the string and horn arrangement. Oh, yeah. It was, I mean, I, always, I knew the horns were there. I knew the strings were there. Uh, but when you actually got to listen to them in isolation, man, the writing was just. Incredible. Yeah, it was. It was so freaking musical. And I mean, especially in disco, man, the, the horn parts, you had to be just like spot on. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, you had to be. Those were like the baddest players back then, too. I mean, those guys back then playing on Michael Jackson stuff, Al Jarreau stuff, the Jerry Hay horns, those guys were like, still nobody can touch that. Nobody can touch that. Yeah, that, I mean, that, 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 that's, that, that took playing. I mean, uh, the earlier uh, stuff that Earth, Wind & Fire was doing, like with, with uh, the Tom Tom 84, and, and, and he, still, he still did a lot of ranging, even, even uh, in the later days once Jerry kind of got on the scene. But like that stuff with Tom Tom uh, and Jerry, you just listen to it, and it's like that took you to school, man. Just perfect. It's like it's they couldn't be played any better. It's just like man, all right, that's what that's the standard right there. That's it. Yeah, yeah. Nobody it, can touch it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's like okay, we have perfection. So. <laughs> we don't need to do it over. That's that's how it's going to stay forever. <laughs> Yeah, actually, yeah, you know, yeah, I was talking about Christian James Han, James Han. He did. Uh, I guess I actually got turned on to him. Um, Jay Webb. Uh, I don't know if you know Jay or not, yeah. but yeah, Jay. Jay had posted something like, "Oh, here's this track of a breakdown of Superstition," and all of us are playing it wrong. And you, you know, start listening to that, and it's like, "Oh, here's the one for Boogie Wonderland," and it's all the stuff that from from uh, from Christian, and like the Boogie Wonderland track. Holy shit, man. I need to go uh, back and check that one out again. Oh, man. It's just, it's just nuts stuff. Yeah. So, you, you know, it's great because he's telling the story of how the, the, uh, the inspiration for the lyrics of Boogie Wonderland are actually from a movie which I had seen, uh, Looking for Mr. Goodbar, uh, which is, you know, about a uh, school teacher start goes out to, you know, goes out to discos and, and uh, gets picked up and, uh, raped and murdered, and so it's a really feel good song. <laughs> so, yeah. Man. <laughs> so yeah, there you go. So Boogie Wonderland is uh, is not all cheery, but the playing man is just absolutely bonzo. Yeah, man. Another guy that I listen to that man nobody nobody knows about is crazy is Paul Kasia. Not many guys know about that. I say his name and who? Yeah. I, oh, it's some of his records. He does a version of um, Eye of the Tiger, and it's just yeah. like, oh. He does a journey medley where he's like playing E flats and F sharps above above double C in lines, and it's just like, ah, oh, nobody was doing that. And yeah. it's just like, yeah. I, that's a guy to definitely check out if anybody checking out this podcast need somebody new to listen to is Paul Kasia. Oof. It's a little cheesy, but it's like his trumpet playing is like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, I mean, it, that was the era of cheese. It was. You know, that that's what it was. I mean, it's like if you go back and listen to Maynard from that that period, you know, it's like, you know, the Battlestar Galactica and you know, all that, that sort of <laughs> – Uber cheesy stuff, and uh, yeah, even like Doc was doing some more cheesy, you know, because you know it, it, they were taking popular music and and trying to put their own spin on it. But you know, it, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if if you can get past that, you know, just listen to the playing. It's like 
holy shit how did these guys do it incredible it's just like and back then they weren't using auto tune and they weren't they, they might have been using they might have been punching a little bit but those guys were for the most part just going through and playing it one to the whole take at a time and that's what i really like about this acapella app is you can't go in there and mess with stuff you got to play each part is one take you can't go oh, i messed that note up let's punch it in so that's why i like seeing these videos because i'm like that's that's real right there you know if it's a little out of tune between these two parts that's awesome because that's real you know what i mean versus oh i'm gonna go auto tune every single note it's perfectly in tune and i mean there's a place for that but i like seeing like the honesty in it when people are like playing the music instead of oh let's make every note perfect kind of thing yeah you know actually that's that's been something that's kind of been a you know a, a sticky point for me and i think it has to it's generational that um you know, especially like the younger, younger kids, younger guys, younger musicians, um, the ones, especially particularly like in their teens and twenties, you know, they've, they've pretty much grown up with this, for lack of a better word, sterile approach to music and recording, you know, where, uh, with digital recording, I love it because I can play like shit and I can go in and I can, I can punch in note by note. Um, but, uh, Sometimes that that you lose the the humanity in the music, you you lose the uh, you know like the feeling of being there. And I was listening to uh, a couple of Canton recordings the other day. Uh, first one was uh, uh, I was listening to Canton seventy six, mm-hmm. and I was listening to um, Live at Redlands. Okay. And, uh, yeah, and you listen to it and like, especially the, uh, like in, uh, in Kenton 76, I think it was Harner, John Harner was playing lead on that one, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, you hear him like, you know, like nail an F or G, but then you hear the pitch waver, like you hear the, yeah, kind of, which all of us do that. Yeah, that's real. And, you know, if, you know, I've been on gigs where I've done something like that. You know, you, you go out, you, you go for it. The pitch bends a little bit. The note cracks or, you know, you crack at the end. And it's like, you know, what the fuck are you doing, man? You know, you got to hit that thing and you got to be on it. Yeah, you, that's what you want to try and do. But the reality is that it's not. Yeah, it happens. And I think sometimes we start to put a lot of pressure on ourselves uh, as especially as lead players, that it's like, yeah, if it's not like studio quality, then you know you start becoming afraid. You start holding back, and yeah, there's always a balance that you have to have of, between you know just, just shitting all over the stage and like like Earth, Wind, and Fire, September. If you really listen to that tune, there's crack notes in it, and mm-hmm. it's awesome. That's one of these staple tunes right there, and it's just like. He's killing it. And it's just like, yeah, he cracked a note here. He cracked a note there. Who cares? You know what I mean? And like, I think that's like a trumpet player thing too. Like if I think it's a lead player thing. If it's like, oh man, there's a crack note right there. People don't really notice that stuff. You know what I mean? Like a saxophone player might listen to another sax player and be like, oh, I heard him do something weird on that note. And we'd be like, I don't know what you're talking about. That sounds great. You know what I mean? So. Well, that's not true because I'd never say a saxophone player sounds great. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, that's that's one of the big mental things in lead trumpet playing too. You just reminded me is um, I went through this, and I know a lot of people go through this. You kind of your mental stat, your your mental state stays equivalent to the last gig you played. Like if you play a gig and you killed it, sounded great on it, you come out feeling great. You have a great couple of days afterwards, everything's great. But you come and you play a gig where you're not happy with it feel like you suck you come out you're kind of depressed you're like oh, what am i doing i shouldn't be i don't know what to do and trumpet sucks and you know what i mean it kind of it, i feel like playing lead trumpet really weighs down on your your kind of mental state yeah yeah I, yeah you know to go back to uh to maynard um one of the things i remember uh, he used to have this this newsletter that went out um called fan addicts for ferguson so i was isn't that great? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this was prior to email newsletters. This was actually this this little yellow, like, you know, six-page folded thing that came in the mail. Um, 
And I remember reading this article, I think I was like in junior high when this, when I got this one. And he was talking about, uh, this is back, you know, in the seventies. And this is, you know, Reggie Jackson was, was like the baseball player. Uh-huh. Yeah. And he's saying, you know, when you're playing trumpet, especially when it comes to playing high notes, it's like, you know, you, you just, you can't be afraid to miss. He said, you just got to go out and you just got to, you got to swing for it. He said, you know, and for example, Reggie Jackson's the highest played, paid player in, uh, in baseball and his batting average is like 300 or something like that. You know, and he's like, so he's getting paid all this money for only being able to hit the ball three out of 10 times. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's like so. If you're, you know, if you even if you hit it half of the time, you're you're doing better than this guy. So why are you beating yourself up over that? Yeah, that's that's definitely true. And like, if you doubt, if you're playing a tune and you're doubting the note coming up, you will miss it nine times out of ten. At least me, if I'm like, okay, I got a, an A above the staff. You're, oh, last time we played this tune, I cracked it a little bit. I'm gonna crack it all over the place that next time if I think like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. I hate it, but like a lot of times when I'm playing a live gig, I like to have one drink before I play. So I don't, that doesn't, it kind of not enough to where it really affects you, but mm-hmm. it, you get out of your head. If that yeah. makes sense. I usually have a glass like this and I fill it with vodka or a bourbon. And that's my one drink. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, but you know, honestly, I, I kind of have this, um, I have this theory about why, musicians uh, particularly jazz musicians have a tendency to uh, a proclivity to either become addicted to narcotics or you know or, or drinking or something like that or the op yeah, well or the opposite opposite in the spectrum is like to become like super deeply spiritual because um when you're being when you're in that super creative mode uh the thing that blocks you from being able to express yourself is, you know, your subconscious mind, you know, the, the, the little chatter that goes on. And it's like, OK, well, you know, if I have a drink or I have a have a smoke or I have, you know, whatever it is that I do to kind of relax my nerves or to, to, to calm me down, then I can play better. And then that then that develops a reliance on on that and instead of just you know trying to figure out how to reprogram your brain but um yeah i mean it's like getting the getting your head out of the way you know i i can remember just i mean i still fight it myself but you know there's like certain notes that always give me trouble and it's like oh shit you know here's that tune that i i I can never play an a i can never play an a and then you you, that's going on in your mind and you know you're never going to be able to play the a so you got to do something just make you get in that you know fuck it mode and and then you're stuck on the whole song thinking about that a instead of ah, we'll just let happens what happens and then you might just miss that one note yeah and and then after after you miss that note then you spend the rest of the night going I missed that damn A. And and then you you know, the rest of the gig sucks because you're you're fixated on that one note, yeah. And that's tough to get that out of your head. That is tough. That is tough to get that thinking to go away because that's everybody I feel like everybody goes through that. And then it's like, man, you missed one note out of six thousand. Well, probably more than that, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like one really, really bad note out of six thousand. That's like, man, in any other profession, you'd be the best in the world. Yep. Except for lead trumpet playing. Except for that. <laughs> that's that's for sure. Yeah, that's cool. All right, man. Well, here's what we're going to do. We're going to switch gears just a little bit. Okay. And uh, I have uh, uh give you time to, to pound it back. Oh, I just had about that much left. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, you know, getting yourself relaxed and ready to, ready to go for it. Uh, <laughs> so this is a segment of the show that I call uh, the Speed Studies. When I was uh, a young trumpet player, um, I was given a, a book by one of my teachers called Nagel Speed Studies. It was a bunch of one of those finger busters, you know. Uh, and, you know, and the idea of this is that you, know, you just like with those speed studies, you never know. It's never going to be predictable. So where this goes is not predictable. It's not a pattern. Uh, the questions are going to come. They're going to come fast and furious. I want your quickest response. This is a speed round. <laughs> is this speed related or no? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, not speed related. <laughs> no, okay. <it's> related. <laughs> okay. All right. Here we go. First question. 
And it's going to, this first listen is going to be about Trump, so it's going to ease you into it a little bit. All right. Okay. Uh, actually, it's not about Trump, but I lied. So, <laughs> who is your biggest influence in, in your life that is not a trumpet player? Oof. See, I can't even do this fast. Um, oh, man. I don't know, man. Pass. <laughs> <laughs> you can call in Jaeger for a lifeline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can I make a call? Okay. What, what's your favorite book? Um, Effortless Mastery. Yeah. I thought you were going to say Taming the Stratosphere. Oh, yeah. That too. <laughs> okay. What's the worst movie you ever saw? Ooh, Waterworld. Mm, okay. All right. If you weren't a trumpet player, what would you do? Uh, something that makes me a ton of money. I don't know. Any <laughs> porn. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite drink? Uh, definitely IPA. Okay. Uh, if you could have a dinner party or you're having a dinner party and you can invite any three people that are alive today, who would they be? Ooh. Doc Severinsen. Um, Hmm. Oh, man, I'm, I'm sucking at this. Um, you already used your pass, so you're right. I did. Um, oof. you said it doesn't have to be trumpet related, right? No, it doesn't have to be trumpet related. Any, any three people. All right. Um, Maybe Elon Musk to pick his brain and figure out how he started up his businesses and stuff. And oh man, everybody I would want to pick is dead. <laughs> um, Jerry Hay would be cool to have at a dinner too. That'd okay. be cool to pick his brain. All right. Okay, there's your three, Doc, Jerry, and Elon. Okay, now let's go to the dead people. <laughs> so, who are three? Who are three people that that uh, are no longer with us that you would like to have for dinner? Oh, probably Frank Sinatra, Maynard Ferguson, Cat Anderson, maybe. Okay, that would be a hell of a hell of a dinner. That would be awesome. <laughs> okay, lacquer plated or raw? Raw, raw, raw. Brass. You like it raw? <laughs> okay what's your favorite quote um my favorite quote hmm man i'm terrible at this i can't do anything quickly um tame the stratosphere there you go <laughs> what's your biggest fear Failure. Okay. Uh, if you could only have one superpower, what would it be? Ooh, teleportation probably. Yeah, it makes getting those gigs a lot easier. It opens up work a lot too. Oh, I got a gig in Japan. Let me get over there real quick. Exactly. Exactly. All right. So this is going to be uh, back to the trumpet world. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you think is the most overrated? I know playing. Okay. All right. What aspect do you think is the most underrated? Improvisation. Okay. So we'll be looking at Taming the Changes coming out as your third book. Oh, I'm not going to be writing that one. You don't want to hear me. <laughs> so I can barely make it through. You'd be like, oh, I guess that's okay. <laughs> All right. Um, if you're able to go back in time and give yourself, uh, your younger self, advice about uh, music, what would it be? Don't play music for a living. <laughs> That's real, but. <laughs> um, and what advice would you give yourself about life? Uh, learn how to be a doctor or a lawyer. I'm not sure I want you being my doctor, Rob. Especially if you need to drink. If you need to drink before you do your job, man, I don't, I don't want you. 
that'd be scary. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't want that. Yeah, well, no. <laughs> no, man. if I had to go back and, and tell myself something about music, I'd probably tell myself to learn how to play more instruments other than trumpet and not focus so much on trumpet. It's just such a hard instrument. You got to – I don't know a lot of trumpet players who play other instruments because it's such a hard instrument to start making music with it. Before you can even make any music, it takes years to learn how to play it right, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've got a friend who uh... – Really great trumpet player, but, uh, you know, he also plays uh, guitar and bass, and he works much more as a bass player than he does as a trumpet player. I bet. So, yeah. Uh, I think you know. if every band has a bass in it, not many bands have trumpet in it. Yeah, I've all, you know, it, for myself, I mean, the, the one thing I wish I'd done is, is uh, really been serious about taking piano. You know, I kind of putzed around at it a little bit and just enough to get through my you know, my first quarter of uh, piano at, in college, but... Me uh, too. And they were just like, hmm, that is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> my piano yeah. teacher just like, oh, man, I, I don't even know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> you are awful at piano. <laughs> you know, but yeah, it, you know, it, it would be something, you know, for me, that, that would be something that I, I really would want to do. Like you said, you know, one, it opens up a world of opportunities for you, but, you know, I think also learning to approach things from like a harmonic uh, position, I, I, like a lot of a lot of pian like a lot of trumpet players who are good keyboard players or, you know, whatever, guitar or whatever, uh, a harmonic instrument. Uh, they have a really unique approach to, the, I think, playing the horn. The same thing with those who started out as drummers. Uh, they have like a real interesting rhythmic approach. So. Right. Right. Yeah. That. Yeah. I never really thought about that before, but that is. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. The really great players who are kind of out of the box are really good piano players, like Arturo. Yeah. I mean, he, he's playing drums and keys, and it's just like, oof, some of the stuff he plays, I'm just like, how do you even think of that? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, um, I know that a lot of a lot of people talk about, you know, it, it, it all, it's, it's coming from inside of you. You know, the music comes from inside of you. But so it's like um, what you hear. You know, it's like, what, what's the music in your, your head, you know, and that's what's going to come out of your instrument. And I think sometimes having uh, those different ways of expressing yourself, uh, you know, whether it be harmonically or rhythmically, you know, that's just going to amplify your ability to, to play the horn. It's going to give you a, a deeper vocabulary. So, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I don't know. But all I know is that I'm almost out of beer myself, which means that it's about time to wrap up this session. All right. <laughs> so... Uh, my good friend, Rob, I appreciate you taking some time on this beautiful day down in Nashville. Yeah, man. Yeah, it sucks up here. It's sunny, but it's cold, but it's all good. I'm out here now. It's great. It's perfect outside. Uh, well, it's all good. It's all good. It's always a good time when you're talking trumpet with a good friend. So I appreciate you, man. As always, and uh, you know, best of luck to you in your endeavors. For people who want to get a hold of you and uh, you know want to buy your book or anything like that, you know, what's the best way to, to hook up with you? Uh, just find me on Facebook. I'm sure most people watching this, their friends will be on Facebook. I mean, I try to just add everybody and every anybody. I try to be friends with everybody on Facebook. But just uh, look me up on Facebook. Send me a message, and we'll make it happen. All right, and so that's, is that Rob or Robert Qualick on Facebook? I think it's Robert's on Facebook. Yeah, it's Robert on Facebook, yeah. Okay, all right, cool. So check him out, facebook.com slash Robert Qualick. And uh, so thanks again, man. And for all of you listening or watching, thank you. And as always, peace and slide grease. We are out. Thanks for having me. All right, man. Hey, thank you so much for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating connection through our mutual love for the trumpet life. I hope that you learned a few things about today's guest and had some laughs along the way. Don't forget to give us a review. We love those five-star ratings. And please share this podcast with your friends. We want to see our hang grow for show. Have a suggestion for a future topic or a guest? Hit me up at thetrumpetgurus at gmail.com. Our opening theme was written and performed by Lexi Signor, and all other music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. So in the words of W.C. Handy, life is like a trumpet. If you don't put anything into it, 
you don't get anything out. So go out there and let your trumpet sound. And I'll see you at the next hang.